away. I, I, was, under, the I was under too close a pressure to whack it away no, in our own penalty area. He was from here, he was coming from there, Glenn. You had the ball here on the outside, you could have whacked it into touch, you could have done anything. But you played it to me. Like you're saying, don't overplay. Yeah, you've tapped it to me when there's three men coming at me. Ultimately, it was two players who wanted the best for the team, who wanted the team to go on and win and succeed. He'd call me in and we'd have a chat about it. Uh, and and uh, get put right, you know. Uh, no grudges held. I love him to bits. He's, he's for me, he's, he, he is and always will be one of my all time heroes. Some of the football we played was exquisite. I had people in football, scouts, coming up to me saying, I used to put you down and go and scout you just because I wanted to watch you play. Not me personally, but your team. We played three at the back, everyone else was playing 4 4 2 and maybe a little bit different at times. But we challenged people with the way we played, and we got up. It wasn't like, oh, pretty football without any, you know. We got up, and uh, we got into the Premier League. It's a big day for everyone, players, fans, officials alike. Well played. Hoddle, the magic of the player manager, has forged a crucial goal for Swindon Town. Typical Glenn Hoddle, in the, you know, the biggest stage for Swindon Town, Wembley Stadium, and he, he comes and scores, you know, from sweeper. It was some game. It was a hell of a game, the 3-0 up against Leicester, with 20-odd to go. We were in total control, we were playing fantastic, Glenn running, the, pulling the strings from the back of, back of the park, making goals. And uh, they came back to three all. And Thompson has equalised! It's unbelievable stuff now! It was an incredible game of football. And then um, we got a penalty three or four minutes from the end. Paul Bowden from the spot for Swindon. He scored! Oh, it's fantastic, and then we did it the hard way, didn't we? We didn't do it easy, 3-0 up and we let it slip, but I'm absolutely elated for the lads. Will you fantastic. be in the Premier Division with them? I'm just going to go up that rule box. Might never get another chance. It was like an emotional week like I never had before. Concentrating on trying to get the team to win, to go up to, you know, to the Premier League. Incredible, incredible time. Hey, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be. We've won. We've won the Wembley. It meant everything to Swindon, it meant everything to Glenn in his career, career as a manager too. And uh, um, So celebrating it afterwards in the dressing room, obviously the bus the next day to in the city. It was amazing, but it must have been a big worry for Swindon because suddenly this genius of a footballer had been thrust into the managerial stage had proved himself quite quickly to be up to the, the task and of course you know, there's going to be a whole host of clubs waiting to get his signature, and that so proved the case. And, and sadly, uh, at the start of the following season, Glenn had gone. Half of me wanted to stay and, and see if we could, could do something and stay up. That would have been the challenge. But in the end, I knew, I looked at it, and I thought, Chelsea, they hadn't done much for 20-odd years, since the 70s, really, cup final. Ken Bates was, was the chairman. I just felt it was the next step to go to. So I was torn a little bit, I was, I really was, but it was tough, it was a tough time for me. Nobody blames them for, for, for taking um, the bigger job on, uh, you know, why, why would he say no? And my only thought is, I wonder what would have happened to Swindon if Glenn had done a run. I'm fairly convinced that we would have um, stayed up in the Premier League. I knew that this club had to go somewhere. They were underachieving. I wanted to, to challenge the players, to make sure that everything was perfect, to try to get them to see that the standard had to, be, had to go up higher in training. The training ground was a disgrace. <laughs> the training ground Harlington, you wouldn't wish that on any professional footballer trying to learn their trade as well because it was difficult circumstances that we had at the time you know it was a big open field you had the planes of Heathrow Airport going over during training sessions and it was a very difficult time. There wasn't a bath in the place there wasn't a gym there wasn't an office my office <laughs> I said to Gwyn Williams the first second day in where's my office and he said office so he, he took me down this was Chelsea Football Club 
and he took me to uh, the, the staff room where all our kit was being laid out by the apprentices and there's a BT phone on the wall and the bottom of it's been taken away. And he said, and there's 50p and I'll put 50p in, it dropped through and I'd have to put the 50p in again. And I was talking to Ron Atkinson and the kids are putting all the towels and the boots around me. That was Chelsea Football Club when I arrived. And that's God's honest truth. So I went back to Stanford Bridge and I, t I took a bit of a chance because I challenged them and it was going to cost them money. And to be fair to them, Ken, he did it. Quite clearly, with the arrival of Roman Abramovich, it took Chelsea to another level. But I think it all started with Glenn. What he did and the style of football, his philosophy is f of football, and the players he started bringing in, and I'm talking about, you know, Dan Petrescu, uh, Mark Hughes, Rude Hullett, which was absolutely massive. I mean, what a name. We're all like, wow, Rude Hullett's come to Chelsea. But you could see in training and, and, and the tactical side and the technical side, he, w he loved it. And he loved the game of almost turning it into a game of chess, in which in many respects, quite in today's football, is, is very much like that. He had his own ideas on where Chelsea would go forward, you know, regarding the style of play, you know, and, and the players that we had at the club. It's a continental football, but a mixture of English football. And, uh, yeah, people loved it, so uh, I think that he, he, he did well. The team he had definitely punched above her weight to play in the uh, FA Cup final in 1994. On the back of that, Chelsea played in Europe in 94 as well for the first time in many years. I think there was Chelsea fans pinching themselves, thinking, uh, how are we playing in Europe? It was, uh, it was immense, really, what we achieved there. And suddenly this call, out of the blue, totally out of the blue. The man of the moment emerged from his house to confirm that he had been asked to take charge of the national side with the first brief of qualifying for the next World Cup finals. All I've got to say is yes, I have been offered the job um, and I've been given 48 hours to, to think about it and I've got a lot of thoughts in my mind and a lot of decisions to make but um, the decision hasn't been made. So that's all I can say. It's a tough one because uh, I was happy at Chelsea, very happy. But when your country comes calling, I've played from the country. I thought, I can't turn it down. How can you turn your country down? It might never, ever come up again. And that's really what made me decision. It might never, ever come up again. You don't know. And that was the decision made. I thought, I said yes. And um, it was early in my career, but uh, I, I took it, yeah. And I'm glad I did. The only job that I would leave Chelsea Football Club for um, would have been for the national job and that goes for any uh, any club in Britain or Europe oh, I loved it I loved it I mean to get the cream of the country there for you and then you had them to train them and guide them as to how you wanted the team to play it was exciting to get Shearer and Ince and Sheringham and a young Beckham and a young Scholes and it was fabulous. The other side of it was the tough side and every England manager will tell you that. You know there's going to be problems there. There's never an England manager that's not going to get a problem but the football side was the thing that, that, drew, that I'm sure draws Roy to it now. It, it drew me, Terry Venables, it was, the, it was working with the cream of the country. It doesn't get any better than that. I loved playing under him. I thought his sessions that he put on as a coach and as a manager were superb. You worked hard without really knowing it. He without doubt knew what he was talking about. Because players can easily suss you out, particularly England players. But Glenn knew what he was talking about. Um, he changed systems, sometimes played three at the back, uh, or wing backs, uh, or four at the back, whatever suited the team at that particular time. It was always, you know, you know, a test training, even, even warm up, keep balls up and that sort of thing. Glenn would join in. He would be the one who would show you how to do it. He had the most amazing talent uh, and was probably still, you know, one of the best, if not the best, the best at it. So it was, uh, you know, great to train next to someone you looked up to as, uh, as a kid. Virtually oh, every one of those players um, you mentioned just now, I think they've all written books. And nearly all of them said, you're an absolutely fantastic coach. And all of them have also said, at times, they felt you looked and sounded frustrated because you were better yourself as a player at doing things. 
Were you ever conscious of that? No, I, I wasn't really. I, 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 I can't remember really thinking that I, I would put that across. Maybe they felt that way. I remember joining in a couple of times when there was an injury and I, I just went in because there was a body needed. So I went in and played because I could still play. Certain players said to me that it was good, they enjoyed that. And others maybe might have not said it to me, but they might have thought they didn't enjoy it. Perhaps they felt intimidated. Perhaps that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. For me, as a coach, I was never going to get frustrated with a player that couldn't do something because every, you know, everyone's got assets. And if you're at England level, they're there for a reason because they're good, they're good players. So it was about getting that out for me as a coach as well as the structure of the team. What's your reaction when people say as a coach, you're aloof, you're distant, you're arrogant? Um, I don't know about arrogant. I think I've, I've worked with a lot of people who are far more arrogant in, in, in football than myself. I wouldn't say that's a trait of mine. I'm not an arrogant person. I wish I was more arrogant, actually, when I was a player. But I was professional. I wanted things done right. And if it wasn't done right, the players would know. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Well, you're probably asking the wrong person because um, he gave me the England captaincy, um, so I think he was the best manager ever. I'm also sure that if you asked one or two others, um, they probably wouldn't agree because um, he wasn't everyone's cup of tea. Um, but I think what happened was is that in, in, in most cases, that if you don't get on with the managers, because probably the manager's not picking you. I love him, don't get me wrong, brilliant footballer, and I would love to have had a better relationship as a, as a player and a manager but it, it, sadly it didn't turn out that way and he was the only one on a training pitch where I felt he was just digging me out in training in front of everybody just to try and make an example of me when it was a, a little bit unnecessary. I got a bit frustrated and, uh, uh, and, and I swore at him and, and that was the only time in my career I ever did that to my manager. Could your man management have been better? No, I, th I, th I think I dealt, I, I spoke with people where I, uh, I spoke with them on an individual level, all of them, different times about the way they wanted, I wanted them to play. Perhaps if I was England manager tomorrow, I'd do it a bit different, of course we would. The main, number one thing for me was clarity. When they went on that pitch, whoever we were playing, the team needed to be drilled knowing what the manager wanted, what I wanted, and I think I got that. One thing you don't want on your CV as an England manager is to not qualify for a World Cup, you know, and that was what was at stake going into that game. It was a, it, that was probably the biggest management game I've, I've, I've ever had. But the feeling when that whistle went, I remember we went into a little huddle, the staff on the side of the pitch, and how we felt that team, you know, it was everyone involved. Great feelings, it really was. and. Um, and a bit of relief as well, I've got to say. What a performance the boys have put in. Uh, really felt we deserved to win the game. We passed the ball extremely well, but we're absolutely delighted. Not only for ourselves, a lot of the lads that, the lot of lads that are watching now, well done boys, you know who you are, you've done magnificent, but uh, not only for that, for the nation. It's eight years since we've qualified for a World Cup. And, uh, you know, we'll see you out there. Well done, Glenn. Cheers. Keeping the faith, Glenn Hoddle arrived at Bisham to answer questions about Eileen Drury, the 58-year-old faith healer who's been working with the England players. Well, I wouldn't have wanted all this just before a World Cup, so let's get it out in the open now. Uh, to me, I've known about it for 20 years, so it's not such a big deal as it is, seems to be to some of the journalists. Someone might have a, a bit of a strain or a, a twinge in the back. So that's where I come in and um, I can give them some healing. My hands over the knee. To be fair, Eileen, you know, she gave me a, a stretch that I had to do over the coming years in order to help me. And it's something that I, that I always did and, and didn't have problems from, from there on. So whether that was a mindset from me or, or something that really worked, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, I've said to other people in, in the past who are struggling, uh, maybe go and see Eileen, you know, there's no harm in it and I think she can help certain people in certain situations. I've been picked in a, in a couple of squads. Um, I then pulled out of a squad uh, where I was injured. Uh, he asked me um, would I go and see Eileen Drury uh, at the time and that wasn't really my thing and, and you know, I needed a, an operation. Nothing was forced upon any player, whether I was at Chelsea, I mean Swindon players, 
it went back to be, only because I'd experienced it myself. You know, with England, I knew that, that I heard that it was going to come out. So I thought, well, I'd rather be in control of it and say that it was. And why wouldn't we try and get every player as fit as we possibly could? You know, that's almost what the job should be. And every England, you know, fan should want that to happen by hook or by crook, by, you know, whatever it, it, it will take. Lining up for the first time, Glenn Hoddle's class of 98. But it's the name of one of those expelled by the headmaster that dominates the news. Everyone focuses on the uh, having to sadly leave Gaza out, which was the saddest moment, you know, management-wise decision I've ever had to make because he was, he, he just wasn't fit. He played in all the games in Rome, he was magnificent. But it had to be done, you know, you have to have big shoulders if you're England manager. Well, he's made a very bold, brave, courageous decision. He will have thought long and hard about it. It's not an easy decision, that. He's left the only player out who would have given us a bit of World Cup experience because he played in 1990. Talking of decisions of national importance, at least one man was glad someone else had to make one for a change. Fortunately, there are some decisions I have to take. There are other decisions for Glenn Hoddle, and he's the right man to take them. Thank you yeah, it was a, str a strange one. It was something that I'd, no one uh, saw coming. It was a, a huge shock, even for the players. We all had to go in and have a five or a ten minute slot with Glenn and that in a way was him being as open as honest as possibly could be. He wanted to give everyone the time to tell them whether they were in the squad uh, or whether they weren't in, in the squad and it was always going to be disappointing for, uh, for some players. Paul wasn't too pleased and one or two things in the room went, um, went astray I think. It was a very very sad uh, sad decision I had to make but there was others there that were just as gutted as Paul. If Gaza or somebody else had been left in the, in the, in the squad I'd have probably got this, you know, criticism for that as well. You know you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't sometimes but you have to be honest to yourself. That's the main thing. Be honest to yourself and you make the, you know, hopefully the right decisions. There was a real belief. Glenn's thought was that we got to believe that we're going to be world champions. And, you know, he gave the boys confidence. He said, you know, when I look around this room, there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it. So we played great football, played like a, an international team should, kept the ball, created chances. Glenn's system worked brilliantly in all the games. And it was just a disappointment that, uh, that we went out uh, when we did. Well, I genuinely believe if we had got through that Argentina game, I think we would have went on to actually win the tournament. I think confidence was high. We could have crumbled when, uh, when David got sent off. We didn't. It was a great togetherness and it was a great performance. And once again, but for penalties. How many times have we heard that as England players? I mean, it was an absolute incredible performance from the players. It really was. It's such a big game to play so well with 10 men for so long. And, uh, you know, there was times when we felt we'd won it in the game with Sol Campbell's goal, you know, the ups and downs. I've never been involved in a game with so many ups and downs. And then the, the, the emotion of the penalties and, and all them things, it was a very emotional night, I remember that, yeah. The England coach took his place at Highfield Road this afternoon to watch some football. But once again, it's matters and beliefs off the pitch, which have again landed him in trouble. As if he hasn't got enough worries trying to secure England's qualification for Euro 2000. More people are calling for his head. In the wake of reports, he said, disabled people were being punished for their sins in a former life. According to the newspapers, this was D-Day for Glenn Hoddle, and as far as his career in football is concerned, this surely was one of the longest days, as he and the country waited to discover his fate. I think if he's really said it in the way he's reported to yeah. have said it, it's very offensive, and, and so it's go. difficult for him to stay in those circumstances, yes. Mm. The only thing I say, I mean, I've had enough experience of going through these types of interviews and all the rest of it, mm. is just, let us... You know, hear his explanation of course, yes, first. Yes. The man himself walks through the massed ranks of the press he sees as so hostile to give them and the country his statement. Regretfully, uh, you will have heard that my contract with the FA has been terminated by mutual consent. I accept that I made a serious error of judgment in an interview which caused misunderstanding and pain to a number of people. This was never my intention and for this I apologise. How do you reflect on the way it all ended for you as England manager? Oh, very sadly. Very sadly, you know. Um, 
and in, in in some ways, Jeff, it, you know, I feel I've all, I will always feel there's like a hole there, really, that 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 uh, I don't think will ever get filled. But I feel as if there's unfinished business there because of the uh, the unfairness of it in many ways. You've always maintained you didn't speak in a fashion the way that you were portrayed, and the journalist has always maintained that that's what you did say. Do you accept that it's never going to go anywhere more than that now? I, th I think it was, you know, he can say what he wants, but I think it was a misinterpretation um, because that uh, that's not, I know what I said, a hundred, a hundred thousand, a thousand percent, I know exactly what I said, but it, and it shouldn't have been in that environment anyway. We were talking about the England-France game. But that was something. But in many, in many things, it was the FA at, the, at that time. It was the people in the in the FA that weren't strong enough to look through that, and for some reason couldn't see the vision that, that perhaps we could see with the squad. I think that was the key. That was the real uh, letdown, if you like, in the sense that they weren't strong enough to say, "Well, hang on, he's still a young man. He's got all this ahead of him. We've got a really good squad." You know, we had the likes of a young David Beckham and a young Paul Scholes. Uh, Rio Ferdinand coming in, Michael Owen, and I had some really good experienced players still available to me. The likes of Seaman and Adams and Shearer, Ince, Turin, and still at their very best. So the balance between the, the, the youngsters and the, uh, the experienced players I had, I was really excited about the Euros. I felt we could do something there. And then it all got taken away for non footballing reasons, which was very, very disappointing. Very disappointing. And uh, very unjust in my eyes. It was very disappointing, there's no doubt about it. I'm not sure how much we've recovered since then, to be honest. I think uh, the manner in which that team played, uh, I don't think we've, we've seen since. I think uh, Glenn is suited to international football, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Who knows, in the future, there, there may be another chance for him to do it. I hope so. When you have a spell like that, you want somebody else to take over the reins and run the team. But if there had been a real tough tie against somebody at this moment in time, I think the timing would have been bad for me. Would you like to be England manager again? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't think it'll ever happen. I'm very happy with what I'm doing at the moment. I'm doing punditry now, I'm talking about football. I, I went back in recently uh, with Harry Redknapp at QPR, but you know I haven't been chomping on the bit to go back in the management game. I'm young enough, I've experienced it before, um, but you'd have to go back into management first, and I'm not sure that'll ever happen. So um, it's just something I'll have to live with. But I'm, I'm very proud of being England manager once, once before. I hope he will come back, it's not too late for him. You know, I think uh, when he talks on television, it's always interesting. You know, you see that this guy understands football. I think English football sort of wasted him, to be fair. I think they wasted him from a playing point of view, and I think they wasted him a little bit from a managing point of view because there's not enough talent in coaching or management in England for Glenn Hoddle not to have a job. I'm very grateful for the, for the career that I've had as a footballer and what it's given me in my life. You know, I've learned so much, I've had great times with great people, made great friends. It's a very, very special sport and, you know, I just hope it stays pure and people just see it for what it is, which is a, a beautiful game. Here's Hoddle with room, going for goal. Oh, sensational! Wonderful technique.